<clears throat> so final week of screens. Final week. And I hope through this series, as we've been talking about screens, that we, we've seen that unfortunately a lot of us are very distracted by the screens in our lives. We get very distracted, distracted and, and ultimately it affects our Christian walk and our Christian life. You know, as we've discussed over these last three, three weeks, some of us may have figured out that we're keyboard commandos. We're these keyboard commandos who hide behind the screens or hide behind the, key, the keyboard or a mouse and we spread nothing but hate and discontent. Because it's very easy to do that when you're on one side of the screen and you don't know the person on the other side. And, and we spread this hate, we spread this, this discontent because we don't look at the person on the other side that they could be our brother or sister. And unfortunately, we've had people within the church and outside the church who would actually say that they would disconnect from Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or anything else because a fellow church member spread hate over the internet. And we've talked about that during the three weeks. And, and ultimately, during these three weeks, I've always said, you can use it for good. Screens and technology can also be used for good things. You know, but we also need to understand that it can affect our walk. It can affect our relationship with Jesus, and it can ultimately affect our relationship with other people. <clears throat> and one of the things I want to focus on today is how screens can be used for good, how they can be used for good in this life. You know, everyone loves a good story. Everyone loves a good story. We all know very good storytellers, especially if it's a fisherman. We know they've got really good stories. Fishermen tell the best stories of all. Okay. But, but and we will generally crowd around someone. If you're in some place and you know, oh man, I know they got a story to tell. You're going to sit and you're going to listen and you're going to kind of tweak that ear to, to hear the person's story and hear what they got to say. Because you, you know it's going to be a good story. You know, and, and think about it. We all have a story to tell. Every one of us has a story to tell. The difference is some of us tell the story a little better than others. But it doesn't take away from the story itself. Every one of us has a story. And, and hopefully that we'll understand that the role of storytelling has been used throughout the Bible. From the prophets of old, if you look at Amos and Ezekiel, they, stole, they told stories. And generally their stories were told with different illustrations that they had to do with themselves. Through the parables of Jesus, we, we saw the stories that Jesus would tell. Even the apostle Paul told stories. And people would really go in and see what it was. And, and it's positive news for us because, you know, in this culture today, Everyone loves a story. Everyone loves to hear a good story. And, and through innovation in films and innovation in television, music, gaming, all of this that's happening constantly around us, we can see and use it for good. Even Microsoft has a position called the chief storyteller. Think about that. Microsoft has a position of chief storyteller. And Microsoft uses storytelling to help people increase their brand or their business. It's just the way they do it. So culture today is all about a good story. We have the greatest story to tell. We have the greatest story in history to tell. And the problem is we don't tell it. But we do have the greatest story. And we all have a chance to tell it. And, and what we're going to look at today is a story that the Apostle Paul tells. And interestingly enough, when we see this from the Apostle Paul, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. But what you're going to see is he is going to meet these people. He's going to engage them right where they are. He doesn't ask them to come into the synagogue. He doesn't ask them to come into the church. He engages them where they are. So if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to open up to Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. 
That's Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. If you don't have a Bible with you, there is one in the back of the pew in front of you. And as a reminder, we will be using technology because it'll be up here on the screens. Um, and if you watch it online, quick reminder for those watching online, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate you using technology and screens to check us out, but never let it get you away from being connected to a local church. You know, we need to be connected to a local body of Christ where we can work on our relationship with Jesus and with others. And like I say each week, and some people don't understand it, hey, it don't have to be here. Just get connected to a local church someplace. I know there are people who watch us online that are not in Palm Beach. So there's no way they could connect with us here, but I want you to connect with the church someplace because that's what we're called to do as believers. So we thank you for being here. As a matter of fact, let's give it up for those watching online today. Woohoo! Thank you. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. I think we may actually have someone from Canada watching us today. Praise God. Amen. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dig in. It's a lot of scripture to read. We'll go ahead and read it, and then we're going to break it down. So Acts chapter 17, verses 6 through 16 through 34. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with those who worshiped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he is telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling and hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar which is inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of the heaven and earth does not live in the shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath in all things. For one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps that they might reach out and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, and even some of our, your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone in the image fashioned fashion by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he is, has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has proved, provided proof that, uh, of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began, began to ridicule him, but others said, we'd like to hear you again about this. So Paul left their presence. However, some joined him and, did, and believed, including Dionysus and Aripopagite, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Heavenly Father, as we dig into your word today, Lord, I just ask that you open up our hearts to receive what it is you want us to receive. Open our ears that we may hear your voice. And Lord, may your spirit continue to move and fill us. And may you be glorified through it all as we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So I mentioned at the opening, I, I talked about storytelling used throughout the Bible. And, and I talked about, you know, the prophets, you know, both Amos and, 
and Ezekiel, even the parables of Jesus. And now we even see Paul using stories. And, and one of the toughest books in the Bible, I think, is the book of Ezekiel. And, and it's interesting because it's really tough to comprehend sometimes what Ezekiel is trying to say or what he's trying to do. But there's a story in Ezekiel chapter 12. And, and it, it's pretty interesting because basically what happens is, is the prophet is given a message from God. He's given a message from God that, that Jerusalem is going to go be taken into captivity and he's got these things he's got to do. And it's really weird because he uses this bizarre set of illustrations to get the story across to people. You know, so Ezekiel hears from the Lord that, that they've been rebellious in Judah. And so Ezekiel is told to pack a bag every day, pack a bag and leave his house like he's going into captivity and make sure people see him do it. So every single day, he packs up all of his belongings and he goes out so that everyone can see him leaving. And then he's told to do the same thing at night, but at night he's told to do it and literally go to the wall, dig a hole through the wall of Judah, go through the wall and cover his head every single night. And when the people would ask him, what are you doing this for? He would tell them the Lord, the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me, and this is what you're going to do. You're going to be taken into exile. So he actually used this illustration so people could physically see him and start going, what is he doing? You know, you think about if we saw someone every day, our next door neighbor, pack up, load up a moving vehicle, and leave every day and come back at night and do the same thing again, we'd be like, what are you doing? You, you would have to ask that question. It would be compelling to, you know, this is kind of weird. i got to ask you what you're doing. And then basically he's saying, the, the Lord told me, this is what you're going to do. This is what's going to happen to you because of your rebellion against me. And that it's a sign for them for what they're doing. And that they're going to be taken into Babylonian captivity. And he's then told to eat his food while like basically and drink his water quaking with fear and anxiety. And, and so that the people would see it and say, so he could say, this is how you're going to eat and drink in the future. You're going to be in fear. You're going to be anxious because of your rebellion against God. So it's actually, you know, you think about it. If we saw that today, we'd be kind of thinking, okay, this person's a little crazy. But he was told to do this and told to tell this story so that the people would understand. And it's interesting because Whitney Woolworth from the, Gospel, uh, the Bible Project actually says this. Sometimes people need strange to shock them into hearing a message they'd rather not hear. The visual nature of the prophet's presentation made his message unmistakably clear to a people who were notorious for mudding the waters of God's word. The Israelites could choose to ignore the prophet's words, but they sure couldn't miss them. Thus, the power of the sign acts. So, you know, and, and unfortunately, I think for many of us, we look at things the same way. If it doesn't really compel us or it doesn't really grab onto us, we're going to ignore it. We're going to ignore it as believers. And, and Lord knows if it's something secular, oh, I'm a, I'm a Bible-believing Baptist. I can't believe it. That's of the world. And if it's of the world, it's got to be of the devil, right? <laughs> That's what mama says. <laughs> But that's not the truth. That, that honestly is not the truth. You know, for, for many of us, you know, we, we, we hold this, uh, this division between secular and sacred. Well, doesn't it all belong to God? Yes. If it all belongs to God, is it really secular and sacred? No. Wow, I, I'm, getting some, I'm getting some feedback today. That's what I like. <laughs> okay, but, but we end up and we look... And, and especially if it comes to entertainment or arts, we're very quick to, oh, that's a secular art. That's secular entertainment. We can't do that. Now, is there a place for that in the pulpit? No. It's, there's no place for that in the pulpit. But at the same time, we've got to understand that there's no, it all belongs to God. And, and even though we may dismiss a creative content, because of maybe the language or the sexual innuendo of, innuendo of it, or maybe the violence. Have any of you read the Bible lately? 
Think about this. God chose to write a book that's full of stories that include objectionable material like rape in Judges chapter 19. Talks about murder in Genesis 4. Talks about cooking food over human excrement in Ezekiel 4.12. And God wrote this as a means for us to understand our sinful nature. So if he wrote about all of this stuff, and, and when we read it in his word, but then we'll say, but this is sacred and this is secular. We've got to separate the two. There is a place in time, but ultimately it all belongs to God, so we've got to use it for what it's worth. And to be certain, discernment must play a significant role in knowing what's profitable and, and what may be profitable for us to partake in or what we can look at compared to what may cause us to stumble. Because there is stuff in the, sec in, in the world that can make us stumble as believers and make us fall back on our walk with Jesus Christ. And there are people who, who face those each and every day and, and have learned to put them barriers up so that they don't stumble. And, and that's basically what we're called to do. But we've got to be able to discern, discern, the, discern the difference and understand that it's not unfair to write it all off. It's not unfair to write off everything that's un. If it's unchristian, it's unnecessary. Hey, it's not. It's still necessary. Everything in life is necessary. You know, Christ-centered resources. You think about this. We have Christ-centered resources online. There's a magazine called Christ and Pop Culture. Now think about that. Christ and pop culture. You kind of be like that. Kind of doesn't make sense. However, what it does is a beneficial resource for seeing how the image of God is in modern day art or you can see it in modern day pop, pop culture and how you can then take it from modern day pop culture and be able to say, hey, do you see God in this? And be able to show people God where they're currently at. So you're able to meet people where they're at and show them where God is in, in times right now what the culture says, you can actually show them where God is. And a lot of times we'll miss it because we'll dismiss it. Well, that's of the world. We, we can't use that. But yet you can use what's inside the world to bring the people who are in the world into the church. But we've got to understand how to do it. And, and we need to en engage in a culture. Can't happen if we isolate ourselves. If all we hang out with is Christians, how are you ever going to tell someone about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because if everyone you know is a Christ follower, who are you going to spread the gospel to? Think about it. Who are you going to spread the gospel? So we've got to go outside and we've got to go into the culture to do it. And a more profitable, we need to have a more profitable, wow, profitable use of our time. Um, and I think a lot of that, think about this. If someone is going in a mission field, if I'm going to go on a missionary trip to Brazil, one of the first things I think I need to learn is the culture and the language. Because if I go to Brazil on a mission trip and I don't understand the culture and I don't understand the language or speak it, am I going to be any good at what I do there? No. So we've got to take the time, just like a missionary would learn about where they're going, we need to also be able to understand the content that we're going to use and be able to use it in a meaningful way. So we've got to understand what the culture is currently saying and what they're doing. And if we want to live faithful for Christ while participating in our society, we want to be able to do it in a way that helps others to recognize God and their need for him. Because everyone needs him. Everyone needs Jesus. Sometimes they just don't know they need Jesus. But what they're looking for is Jesus. They just don't understand it. And Andy Crouch actually said this. He said, I wonder what we Christians are known for in the world outside of our churches. There's a thought. Are we known as critics, consumers, copiers, condemners of culture? Probably. And he even said, I'm afraid so. Why aren't we known as cultivators? People who tend and nourish what is best in human culture, who do the hard and painstaking work to preserve the best of what people, of what people before us have done. Why aren't we known as creators? 
people who dare to think and do something that has never been done, uh, never been thought or done before, something that makes the world more welcoming and thrilling and beautiful. Why aren't we known as cultivators? You think about it. We are known as the people who are going to be critics, consumers, skeptics. That's what we're, we're hypocrites. Ask anyone, what are Christians? Christians are hypocrites. That's what we're known for in the world. We should be changing the culture. We should cult, be the cultivators in this world. We should be the ones that are nourishing the best parts of human culture. But we don't. We don't do that. Instead, we just go along with the flow. Or we just decide we, we're not going to follow Jesus and the culture wins. And unfortunately, that happens to a lot of the younger people. They'll grow up in church and then they go away. They go to college or get to that point of even in high school, the later years of high school. And all of a sudden, it's not about Jesus anymore because the culture grabs them and it's way more intriguing than Jesus. But we've got the greatest story ever told. The problem is the culture is telling a better story than we are. We need to be able to tell the story of Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done in our life and change the culture instead of the culture changing us. But we get so caught up the other way around. And I think it's a challenge for believers in how we create or we consume entertainment. You know, what are we doing? You know, oftentimes I think all these Christian movies that are released, you know, are they good movies? Yeah, they're, well, they're okay. There, there's some decent ones. But, but I don't believe there's a place where the movie God's Not Dead ever bridged the gap between a non-believer and a believer. And I really don't think it took anyone as a believer as good. Um, the movie God Not Dead, I'm not picking on the movie. It's a great movie. But it didn't increase my faith. It didn't increase my faith. It really didn't do much for me at all. It was a good movie. But at the same time, Someone who was a non-believer, I don't believe, would watch that movie and all of a sudden say, man, I need to know Jesus, which is unfortunate. And Allison Wilkinson, who actually did a thing, I'm a Christian, I hate Christian movies, said this. The glaring problem with God's Not Dead and most other films made for and marketed at the faith audience is that instead of exercising and challenging the imagination of their, ten, of their audience in ways that would make their audience better Christians... They shut down imagination and whisper sweet nothings into their ears instead. Which is the truth. Most Christian movies, like I said, we'll sit down, we'll show them in the church and be like, man, that's a good movie. Did it make you a better Christian? Probably not. Make you kind of feel good? Yeah, you kind of felt good for a little bit. Would it make a non-believer into a Christian watching a movie? Probably not because it's not a good movie to them. You know, they're normally not the best actors or actresses. The filming's generally not the best quality. Yeah, but it's a good movie. I'm not going to knock it. But does it challenge us to do what we're called to do? As believers, our priority isn't to feel good. It isn't about feeling good. It isn't about flattering ourselves. It's about building the kingdom. That's what we're called to do. We're called to build the kingdom of God. It's not about us. It's about him. It's not about this church. It's about the kingdom. Everything is bigger than what we see in front of us. And we get so caught up on this. We get so caught up on these four walls. We get so caught up on this. And, and one of the coolest things I think about film, art, and music is, is that it's got a power to meet us where we are. And we as Christians won't meet people where they are. We'd rather just stay in our little holy huddles, our us four and no more. But we've, we've got to be able to go out. And we may be tempted sometimes, man, I'm just going to break this phone, this iPad. I, I can't deal with it. I'm shutting off my Wi-Fi because technology is so bad. Because you're not using technology for good. You're getting so caught up with what people are saying and what people are doing. And instead of spreading love and joy, maybe you're the one spreading the hate and discontent. And I've seen it, so I know it is some of the ones here. I've probably been guilty of it myself. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago. We've got to do what's right. 
And now you may be saying, okay, pastor, you've talked all about this. What's this got to do with screens? What's this got to do with technology? Well, for the past four weeks, behind the scenes, I've been not only teaching on screens, but I've been using screens. Of course, I've been using screens a lot longer than four weeks, but, but I've been using screens to do ministry for the last four weeks. And you see, the old ministry model was always, you know, you invite someone to church. You do TV ads or you do radio ads. Or how about those great direct mail flyers? Let's get a list of all the addresses in the neighborhood and send out a mass mail out. Remember them? They worked great, didn't they? <laughs> That's what I thought everyone would be saying. Nope, don't work. Or, or, you know, we do the whole bring a friend series, invite your one, all these different things. And I will say invite your one, bring a friend, you know, bring a friend Sunday. They are good. But ultimately, what we would do is we'd do all of this, invite, invite, invite TV, radio, direct mailers. And we'd tell them, hey, come into church so you can do ministry. So then you'd want to get them inside the church so then when they got in church, what could they do? Well, then they could pray or they could be baptized or they could accept Jesus Christ. They could get into a small group and then they could volunteer, all of these different things. So it was kind of like, let's invite them in, then we'll teach them how to do ministry. Well, basically with the use of screens, what I've done is I've reversed that role because what I'm doing is I'm doing ministry first. So what I did is I created a Facebook post that I've been running for four weeks now. And Micah, go ahead and show this video. Hey, I'm Ken. I'm the pastor at FBC Land 10. And, and one thing I know as a pastor is each one of us is going through something. You know, we're either going through the storm, we're just coming out of the storm, or we're about to go into the storm. And I don't know what it is, whatever it is that's just heavy on your heart right now. Do me a favor, click on the link below, send me a message. I'll respond to each message individually and I will take the time to pray for you because, you know, hey, it really doesn't hurt to have a pastor praying for you, right? So, hey, go ahead. Send me your prayer request so that I can pray for you today. Have a blessed day. So what I did is I changed and did ministry first. So for four weeks, I've been running this ad on Facebook. I have received 51 prayer requests in four weeks. And I have responded to every individual prayer request, either typed or actually sent an audio prayer for the people, doing ministry first, meeting them where they're at. Now, it is interesting because during that four weeks, you know, as I've talked about hate and discontent, whoo, hey, how can I pray for you? You would think that's nice and simple, right? How can I pray for you? I have had people use some not so nice words about you really think prayer works and you need to da, 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 da. I've had people send prayer, basically a prayer request. I'm going to pray for you that God will open your eyes so you can see this. Really? And I've actually went back and messaged the people and I've had conversations back and forth. Hey, you know, you seem to be a little upset. How can I pray for you? What can I do for you? And try to bridge that gap to do ministry first and had one. We went back and forth for a while. He got upset because I gave him a, the ancient Greek version of something. So he got upset and said that my education doesn't work for him because God wrote the Bible for a simple man. So I gave him a simple answer. And then he told me that's why I'm a Baptist. and I'm not in the right church. <laughs> I left it at that. Uh, the part of me wanted to reply so bad. But then I reminded myself, let no unwholesome words come out of my mouth except what is to build up others according to their needs. So instead of blasting someone and being a keyboard commando, I just left it as I'm to love one another as Jesus loved us. So I left it at that. But there's been a lot of hate and discontent with it. But I'll tell you at the same time, over the course of a month, that video has been on 4,661 screens. 4,600. So that means someone has opened up Facebook, iPad, computer, and it has come across their newsfeed. Now, it doesn't mean they actually watched it, 
but it does mean that it showed up. And it's cost me $120 to do that for an entire month and be able to physically pray for 51 people. Praise God. I'll do that all day long. That is ministry first. And that's what we're called to do. Now, I will tell you, I'm going to take that a step further because now that I'm starting to do that first step of doing ministry first, of course, that next step is, you know, I'm following back up with them. Hey, how'd this go? How are you doing here and there? So you know what my next step is going to be? Because I'm already doing ministry, the next step will be, hey, why don't you plan a visit and come to church? Why don't you come into church so I can pray for you in person on a Sunday morning? So that would be the next step. So I'm reversing that model and say, hey, come on in and do ministry. I'm doing ministry and then going to ask them to come in. Now, of course, as this grows, it means it's, we're going to need some help. And I know all you, oh man, really, Pastor, now are you going to make me help you? But you think about it. <laughs> so if someone comes into a church, think about yourself. When you come into a church for the first time, you don't know anybody. If only a couple people say hi to you, are you going to come back? Probably not. But now if you connect with someone at the church, are you going to come back a second time? More than likely, yes. So basically the thing would be if I get someone who, when I say, hey, why don't you plan a visit and come to the church, and they say they're actually going to come, is I will connect them with someone from the church to meet them at that door. And you meet them at the door, you have them come in, you have a conversation with them, answer any questions they got to answer, find out some stuff about them. Might find out, hey, you know, they, they're just coming through recovery. Then you might say, hey, you know what, I, I know someone in the church who currently does a 12-step program. Let me introduce you to them. And then you can introduce them to someone with the same type of background they have. So now odds are, and then you turn around, you sit with them, you spend time with them, bring them up after, make sure you bring them by. Hey, I want you to meet Pastor Ken. And we go ahead and we pray for that person together. Odds are they're going to come back. And then they're going to keep coming back because we did ministry first. And that's what we have to do. We have to be able to do ministry first. Amen. And, and, and uh, something I, I think we got to understand, some of you, you know, we, we've all heard these stories. And, and even Jesus, his ministry is what he did first. You think about it, all these people who started following Jesus. Why they follow him? Because they heard his stories. They heard the stories of his ministry and what he was doing. He was healing the sick. He was healing lepers, making the blind see and the crippled walk. So people heard his message. They heard about the ministry. So what they do, they came to it. Hey, we need to go see this Jesus guy, man. Hey, I know you got leprosy. Here, come see Jesus. He, he's touching lepers. We're trying to stay six feet apart from each other. Jesus touched lepers. He healed the, you know, he healed crippled, made them walk. So people followed him because of they heard about his ministry. And like I said, understand, I don't want you to think this doesn't mean stop inviting people. We should still invite people to church. But if you're going to invite someone to do, ch to do church with you, hopefully you'll do some ministry with them first. Do some ministry before you ask them to come to church. Romans 10, verses 13 through 14. And I purposely did this in the New Living Translation because I just love the way it reads. And it says this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have not heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Now think of this. Everyone think of someone that you know that doesn't know Jesus. And let's go ahead and answer these questions. How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? Can they? Nope. Okay. So we're, so we're good so far. Everyone said no. Okay. How can they believe in him if they've never heard of him? They can't, right? All right. So now read this last line with me one more time. Everyone ready? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Read it with me. And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? 
right? So who needs to tell them? Y'all. Now, if they happen to come in here, I'm going to tell them. You know, I'm going to tell them. But shouldn't you do ministry and tell them before they get here? And, and I know some of us will say, man, I, I'm too old. I've done my part. Well, works never got anyone into heaven. Just so you know. And, and if you're basing your life off of I've done enough, then you're basing your salvation off of works in my mind and in my work and what I would say. Because we're never done until we see Jesus face to face. So we're not too old. We're not too young. Neither one. We're, we're, we're to do his work until he calls us home. Because he's never finished with it. He can use each and every one of us. And, and, and we see even in the Apostle Paul, you, you look at the Apostle Paul today. He tells a story and he meets the people right where they are. Areopagus. I was singing it earlier, so I'd remember how to say it. <laughs> Patty was like, you better not start singing that from the pulpit. <laughs> the Apostle Paul told a story. He engaged the people right where they were. He engaged the people right where they were. And he tells the story of creation through Jesus Christ. He takes them from creation all the way to Jesus' resurrection and points it to an idol that they were using in their life. Using culture, something that they had every day in their life, he took it and through his story told them that's Jesus. The idol to an unknown God. Let me tell you about that God. He used pop culture of the day to turn people to Jesus. We can use pop culture today. We can use today's technology, today's screens, all of this that many people may say is good and it's of the devil. We can use it for good and turn people to Jesus Christ. It all depends on how you do it and what you do with it. Just like my Facebook ad, I'm just opening a door for people who don't know me they may not know God, but they know something's not right in their life. They know they need prayer. I don't know God, but hey, hey, can you pray for me? Yeah, I'll pray for you. Every one of us should be willing to pray for somebody. Every one of us knows someone who needs prayer. And every one of us could be a game changer in someone's life. We just got to take them steps. We got to be willing to engage them and meet them right where they are in order to go through it. And using technology to break down walls to do ministry, I think is an amazing thing. It's what we are called to do. It's not about spreading hate and discontent. It's not about having brothers and sisters in Christ wanting to get off of Facebook because of the politics and the words and everything else that are being used out there. Because that's what we see. We are to love one another as Jesus loved us. That's what we're called to do. And we don't do that well enough. When I get told that's because you're a Baptist and you're not part of the true church, gee, thank you. I so bad wanted to say, well, you know, we did baptize Jesus because John was a Baptist, but I didn't want to go there. <laughs> but we can use it for good. Don't be one of those spewing hate. There are people who don't, there are people who do not go to church because they've been hurt by a church. They've been hurt by so-called Christians in churches. Or they're upset with someone else who's in a church and these so-called Christians have, have put so much hate and discontent out there in conversations that they don't want nothing to do with it. And despite that, they'll send someone they don't know who says, hey, it won't hurt to have a pastor praying for you, right? They'll send me a prayer request. Because they know there's a God and they know they need him. We just need to bridge that gap. We just need to bridge that gap and move forward in a, affecting other people's lives. So screens. is a reason it's called outreach and not inreach. Because outreach involves us going 
out to where they're at. We need to go out to where they're at. And whether we go out physically to where they're at, or whether we use the screens and technology to reach them where they're at, we can do all of this for good. It's just how you want to do it. But it is outreach and not inreach. It's about outside these four walls, not inside these four walls. Reaching out where people are at, meeting them where they're at, and meeting their needs. We can't meet them all, but we can pray for people. And prayer works. Even though some of the people who made comments didn't think prayer works, but that's okay. Prayer works. So questions I got. How are you using screens and technology? How are you currently using them? Are you using them for good? Or are you one of those out there spreading hate and discontent? Or is that screen become an idol in your life that is taking total control over you that the first thing you do in the morning is pick it up to see what's on it? As I talked about last week, that, you know, being distracted, that ding. <gasps> I got a Facebook post. I got a Facebook message. I got a text message. I got something. How quick we are to grab our phone and look at it. Just because of a sound. Shouldn't we look to Jesus that same way? Let him be the first thing we think about. And most importantly, what is your story? We all have a test that we've gone through, which is part of our testimony. We've all had a mess that's part of our message. What's your story? And the question is, are you telling your story to other people? And your story is simple. This is my old life. This is who I was. Every one of us know who we used to be. And then you take that step over in your story and you say, this is when I met Jesus. And your next step is, this is what he's done for me. That's the old me. This is the new me. Everyone's story is different, but every one of us has a story. Some stories are way more powerful than others. But it doesn't matter. Your story is your story. And when you can take your story and lead people to who Jesus is, you're doing what you've called, been called to do. We're storytellers. We've got the greatest story ever told and we're failing at telling it. And culture is winning because they're telling better stories than us. Become a storyteller. Become a storyteller for Jesus. Like I said, everyone loves listen to fishermen because they got the best stories. Fishermen and hunters got the best stories. That's why I've done both. Because I can tell you some stories. <laughs> and every time I tell the story, the fish may be a little bigger. The deer may have had a couple extra points. <laughs> but it gets people intrigued. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. Well, that's okay. I want you to know that he'll accept you right where you are and right how you are. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. God's word says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, by his blood, that the, when we did communion today, it said, a new com, uh, this is the new blood of the new and everlasting covenant for the forgiveness of sins. His shed blood is what forgave us our sins. Our confession and our belief in him is what provides us that salvation. He forgave you of your sins before they ever happened. Because none of us are older than him. He knew exactly where you would be, what you'd be doing in your life, and he still willingly died on a cross for you. And if you're ready to say, you know what, I'm all in. I need, to, I need to live my life for Jesus. During this final song, come up and see me. I'll be off to the side. We'll say that prayer of salvation. 
and we will welcome you to this messed up, jacked up family of Christ followers. Because we're all messed up and we're all jacked up, but one thing we know is we are all loved. We are all loved. And maybe you just need to make that recommitment and say, you know what, I haven't been telling my story. I haven't been doing what Jesus called me to do. And, And through this whole series of screens, Pastor, I've realized I've been that keyboard commando. I've been spreading hate and discontent instead of spreading love. And maybe you're just saying, hey, you know what? I'm done. I've done my share. And and you think you've earned your way into heaven. You might want to come up and ask him if you've really earned your way into heaven. Because you can't do it by works. And we're not done until he brings us home. I don't know what it is, but if you need prayer, just come on up front. You can leave it at the altar. I'll be off to the side. Whatever it may be. And Heavenly Father, I raise this congregation to you. Lord, that we will become the storytellers that you've called us to be. That we will tell the greatest story ever told about how you took us, a lonely sinner, and you died on a cross for us to give us salvation and give us victory over death so that we may spend eternity with you in heaven. Lord, that is better than any story that's out there in the world today. But we don't tell it. And Lord, may we be a people that do ministry first. May we seek to do ministry outside these walls and seek to meet people right where they are. Because Lord, you met us right where we were. That we will engage people where they are and steer them towards you. And teach them of your saving grace and your saving knowledge and wisdom, Lord. And Lord, I just ask that you continue to be with us throughout this week and make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.